Hello and welcome, students of Pali, to this continuing companion to A.K. Warder's Grammar Guide, An Introduction to Pali. And there are links down in the description below to resources if you need them. Today we look at Lesson 10, which covers the future verb and the genitive noun case. This is Pali Studies on the Learn Pali channel. So first we have the future tense in Pali and we're going to look at both how it's formed and how it's used. The future verb inflection is created by the addition of the suffix sa and when this is added to the present stem we use a joining i sound whilst dropping the final vowel of the stem. But stems belonging to the seventh class, those that end a, keep this vowel. Although most forms of the future are based on the present stem like this, sa can be added to the root, in which case the root vowel is normally strengthened. To roots then that end in vowels, sa can be applied directly. However, roots which end with a long vowel, this must be shortened, because long vowels can't come before a double consonant. And when the root ends in a consonant, a joining i sound is generally inserted. However, sometimes this doesn't happen and the consonant assimilates. We can generally divide the assimilation of s into two groups, those resulting in ka and those resulting in cha. So this type of assimilation is actually quite easy to remember. Note also that a final r sound may just be dropped. It's actually quite common with the future tense to get multiple forms for the same verb. Those formed on the present stem and those from the root. Again we have to watch out for those double consonants as they can hide an inflectional affix. And these are just the base forms which then have to be inflected to agree in both person and number with their subject. And we do this with the same personal endings as we've seen with the indicative tense. The meaning of the future tense in Pali pretty much overlaps with how we'd use it in English. Note that English doesn't have a future verb inflection, but instead uses auxiliary verbs, will or shall, in combination with a present tense verb. There are also a few future tense verbs formed on the passive stem, like we saw in the last lesson. And so this creates a simple future passive sense. Anger will be abandoned. Again, we have to use a past participle in English to create a passive sense. And for more on this, refer back to last week's lesson. But in Pali, there are also some specialised meanings of the future tense which aren't shared by English. It occasionally strays into marvelling, as in what may be. For instance, although this literally translates, this my son, he will be, the future here implies wonderment, as in, this must be my son. This use of the future to imply shock or wonderment is actually common in Sanskrit too. In Pali, perhaps the best example of this use is in the Donna Sutra, where it's used to express surprise in the sense of, how can this be? Here, Bhavang is an appellation for the Blessed One, meaning Sir, and No, I think here, is just an emphatic. So, Donna the Brahmin is asking the question, A Deva, Sir, will be? Down the ages, translators have rendered this in various ways, but basically it means, Can it be, Sir, is a Deva? Okay. Next, Warder introduces the genitive noun case and we'll quickly look at how this is formed before we discuss how it's used. So if we now add the genitive endings to the case endings we've already seen, in the singular there's the quite characteristic asa ending, and although it looks like the future tense, it's applied to nouns and so therefore is a noun case. Neuter nouns take the same forms as the masculine, whilst feminine nouns take that ea ending 
which is the same as the instrumental. And the plural has the same forms across the board, regardless of gender. Now, the genitive case is extremely common in Pali, and its most basic sense is that of possession or ownership of something. And so in English, it's usually created by adding an apostrophe s to a word, or preceding that word by of, as in the Brahmin's house, or the house of the Brahmin. Usually, the genitive noun is placed immediately before the word or phrase, which it qualifies, and notice that it's the owner that is marked in the genitive, and not the thing owned. More generally, the genitive can be used to indicate a relationship between people, objects, parts to holes, etc. In fact, the genitive has many shades of meaning, and Warder lists a whole range of uses, and I'm only going to pick out certain ones of interest here. So the notion to have is commonly expressed in Pali, using a noun in the genitive case plus a verb meaning to be. Usually from either who or us. So if we take an example, this literally translates as the goats are of the Brahmin, but means the Brahmin has goats. An offshoot of this is with expressions like tasa evang ahosi, and similar variations. We haven't seen the pronoun tasa yet, but this literally translates of him thus was. Here, the genitive implies a sort of internal mental attitude or thought. So it occurred to him, or he thought thus. Perhaps before we go any further, we need to look at a few more genitive forms. Warder lists a few, but for completeness, I'll list most of them here. So, if we look at the personal pronouns that we saw back in lesson five, we can see that tasa is a third person. Genitive form meaning of him or of it, and in the plural this would be te sang. And if you recall, the third person forms can also be demonstratives. These are from the pronoun stem ta, but there are also other pronoun stems, and these are the ones based on ima. Now I think there's a typo on page fifty six of Warder's guide. He has the feminine form of eang as being. Imasa, and I think it should be imisa. And if I just flash up the other noun types that we saw back in lesson three, those of Bhagavant, Brahman, and Rajan, and we should also pay some attention to the declension of participles. If you recall, participles decline like adjectives to match the case, number, and gender of their subject, and so can take any of the three genders. I have to admit that the available guides aren't particularly clear, so these tables that follow are my supposition. First, if we look at the past participle, this takes the affix ta, and to this are added the a stem endings that we've just seen. And now, if we look at present participles, those which are formed with the affix mana take these usual a stem noun endings. Whilst the more common present participle affix nt take these a stem noun endings in the masculine and the neuter, but in the feminine they take the e stem endings, and we haven't seen these yet. And then there's also an archaic form as well, if you remember. And these take their own set of declensional endings, which I think are only found in the masculine and the neuter. And you might wish to refer back to lesson eight, which covers participles. Well, that's a lot of endings. So let's return now and look at how participles work with the genitive. Occasionally, when a genitive noun is accompanied by a participle or a verbal noun, the meaning can often be ambiguous. For instance, consider the boy's washing. Now we can understand the genitive here as marking the agent of the verbal action, that is, the boy is doing the washing, and this is called the agent or subjective genitive. 
Or we could understand this as it's the boy who is being washed. And so the genitive noun would be the patient undergoing the action of the verb. And this is sometimes also called the objective genitive. And so hopefully you can see that this can only occur when the possessive nature of the genitive refers to participation in an action. And let's now look at some examples in Pali. The Brahmin is honoured of the village. Here the action expressed by the participle is being done by the noun in the genitive. The village is doing the honouring. And we would tend to render this in English as honoured by the village. Now the objective genitive is very rare in Pali and this is because participles can take direct objects which will be in the accusative case. So for the seeing of the Blessed One here we're not talking about the Blessed One's capacity to see it is he, the object, who is being seen. But objective genitives proper do occur occasionally in prepositional phrases for instance, for the veneration of the Tathagata. Here the noun in genitive is the object being venerated, not the one doing the veneration. And notice the verbal nouns in these last two examples are in the dative case which we haven't seen yet, but basically can be expressed by the preposition for. Finally, similar to the agentive genitive is the absolute construction, or genitive absolute. Now this shouldn't be confused with the absolutive inflection. The absolute construction is when a participle and its subject noun are in the same case, usually either genitive or locative. But importantly, the subject noun of the participle is different from the subject of the finite verb in the main sentence. So the term absolute here refers to a clause that is syntactically detached or bracketed off from the rest of the sentence. And this clause then provides the context or circumstance for the sentence as a whole. In an absolute construction, the possessive nature of the genitive takes on an additional meaning of while or while doing. So here, rudantanang is a present participle in the genitive plural, meaning weeping, which agrees with its subject, mata pitunang, in gender, number, as well as case. Whilst the main verb is a past participle, with an implied singular subject, he, and this is clearly different from the parents who are doing the weeping. And so that secondary sense of the absolute construction, as well as meaning while, can mean while disregarding, or in this case, despite. Despite the mother and father's weeping, he went forth. And if we look at another example, here, jayato is a present participle in the genitive, meaning burning, and this agrees with its subject, the house. Whilst the subject of the main verb is again an implied pronoun, he. So we get despite the house is burning, he abides, mind concentrated. Now, these constructions are rare, so don't worry too much, but it's worth paying special attention when genitives and participles occur together. So, that is lesson 10. There's a bit more vocabulary to learn, and this is followed by exercise 10. Of course, you can find the answers to exercise 9 over on the Wisdom and Wonders webpage, and there's a link to that down in the description below. And next week, we'll be looking at adjectives in Pali. And of course, in the meantime, feel free to check out my other tutorials.